Welcome back, everyone. We are so happy that you're here for another episode of Real Talk About Feminism, the best podcast in the world. We're so glad you're here. Your hair looks cute. Oh, thank you. Everyone go to YouTube and look in Kenza's hair. <laughs> I love the slicked back style because mm-hmm. my hair is greasy and dirty and it just looks cute. Yeah. And it's in a braid. I like it. Thank you. It doesn't look greasy and dirty, but it's well, cute. thank you. Mm-hmm. You know when it just feels that way. Yeah. Yeah. I need to really go in there with my scalp brush. Yeah. <laughs> okay, guys, we have another exciting episode today, but we are first going to talk about our obsessions of the week. Yes. So I am obsessed with like some people call it fairy hair, but like just putting tinsel in your hair mm-hmm. and having like tinsel highlights. It's cute. It's so cute. And we're definitely doing it for summer. Yeah. I've seen it. It's kind of hard to do. Mm-mm. I thought the same thing. And then I looked up some videos on YouTube. Do you remember the feathers? That feather yeah. trend? You literally just do the same thing. Oh. You just get the clamps or the little beads. I've just beads seen and you clamp them people down. like tie them in. I know. And I think that's if you really want them to stay for like months. Okay. But we're not going for that. We just want, you know, quick and The easy. clamps are easy. Yeah. We can do yeah. That. We could literally go to Sally's and get a pack. We should do it today. Yeah, we should. It's okay. not hard. But do you think that would look good, like, with my curly hair? Yes. Trust. Are you sure? No. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe Because, like, if we got it up... today and I, like, my hair's straight right now, so, like, it would look really good. Well, let's look up if you can curl it. Like, if you can use heat on it. I mean, if not, I just pull it out. But, That's like, true. is it going to look weird if my hair is curled and then it's just It's just, like, straight. a straight piece of tinsel. Yeah, I don't know. We'll see. We'll look yeah, it up. We'll look it up. Um, maybe next time we record, we'll have fairy hair. It's so cute. It's such a vibe. Mm-hmm. My obsession kind of goes along with that. Um, just like cute stuff in your hair. Um, so we got these little like clip-ins. There, it was like two for five. Mm-hmm. Um, these little clip-in like charms. And if you go to my Instagram at Haley Page One or Haley Page Underscore, I mean. Um, it used to be Haley Page One. Um, then you'll see it in my St. Patrick's Day post, but it's like, it's just little charms. It's like a strand of charms. You clip it in like a little clip in extension. I hit it really well. Yeah, it looked really good. And it was cute. Like, it was just fun. It's definitely spring vibes. Yeah. No, I literally love that though. I think it's so fun. Like the hair wraps. Mm -hmm. And then last summer when we went to New York and you put the beads in our hair. Right. That is so cute. So cute. Yeah. So just anything like that. Like it just adds. Like it just adds. I love it. So maybe next time we record we'll just have very decorated hair. But definitely this summer we will. For sure. Yeah. Um, Okay. This week's episode we're gonna do the feminist highlight but this week's episode another uh it's the last week of women's month of course it's always women's day but in our book (laughs) yeah but um it's the last um, week and so we're just gonna like talk about some current events things going on in the world um but first ken's as always is gonna bring us our feminist highlight today's highlight is Susanna salter And I got this story from an account on Instagram called Upworthy, and they posted about this. So Susanna Salter. In 1887, a group of men added Susanna Salter's name to a mayoral ballot as a joke intended to humiliate women. Mean. I know. Instead, she won over 60% of the vote and became America's first female mayor. Slay. Isn't that such a slay? No, that is such a slay. Literally. I'm obsessed with that. I was obsessed with that because... They were trying to be mean. Yeah. And then she becomes the mayor of the city. <laughs> Good for her. Hilarious. And yeah. then she's the one making the policy and they have to follow. <laughs> yeah, literally. She's like, um, I'm the leader now. So I love that. Short but sweet feminist highlight today. Yeah. Um, okay. Do you have any like updates or anything, or are we just getting straight to business? I really don't, actually. Okay. All right. Let's get into it. Okay, so the first, we're I'm going to cover three different current events going on, so this will be like a little shorter of an episode, but these are very important things to talk about. The first one being the situation in Iran still going on. So Masa Amini's death was about six months ago at this point. Isn't that crazy? That's insane. It feels like it like happened like a month ago. Mm-hmm. Um, but we don't want to forget that whole situation because Masa Amini's death like sh- 
started like a bunch of protests and stuff. And there was protests here in the U.S. And obviously we did an episode about it. But then here in the U.S. it's kind of fallen off. Right. And so I was reading this article about it. And um, I didn't use any information from it in this episode, but I was just reading it. And that's what prompted this topic because it was talking about how, um, like, basically, like, feminists who still aren't fighting for Iranian women are fake, Mm -hmm. basically, because, like, it just got forgotten about. Right. And it's easy, like, especially, like, in America and, like, as white women to, like, forget that, but the one part of the reason that we love doing the podcast is because we love to share mm-hmm. about feminism worldwide and it's really right. important to not forget that because it's not just us ladies in America like literally there's tons of countries where women's rights are under attack right and Everywhere. women are fighting every day and we need to give them a voice because their government is oppressing them and the people are oppressing them and mm-hmm. they need a voice exactly um i love that thank you for saying that So, kind of to get into it, recently, this happened on March 8th, which was Women's Day, Mm -hmm. and um, there was five Iranian women who posted a video, and they were dancing in public without headscarves, and this was in defiance of the country's modesty laws, um, because with like Sharia law, they're not allowed to like they have to wear loose fitting clothing. They have to wear headscarves when they go out, and dancing in public is like against the law. Mm-hmm. So they were wearing crop tops. They were not wearing headscarves, and they were dancing to show defiance. Mm-hmm. And I think it's really powerful that they did this on Women's Day because women in their country have absolutely no rights. Mm-hmm. And so they said no on Women's Day we're standing up and we're being defiant and they could literally be killed for that. Mm -hmm. So it's really brave. Yeah, it is. So, um, the video went viral as a symbol of resistance and people all over the world started recreating the video to show support and stand in solidarity because after this, like the government was trying to find the girls, the women and like make them apologize and get them in trouble because they really defied the laws. And so it was scary for them. Like, they did that knowing that they could be put to death. Yes. For posting a simple video. So um, this is, I'm going to quote this from the article, which will be in the show notes. It says, in the six months since Masa Amini's death, Iranian security forces have routinely used draconian tactics to try to suppress protests going so far as to arrest children. In a report released Thursday, last Thursday, Amnesty International found children arrested during during and after protests had been subject to electrical shocks on their body, been threatened with rape, had their heads held underwater, and been sexually assaulted. Many children were released only after they signed, quote, repentance letters and promised not to participate in further protests, according to the Human Rights Organization. So, obviously, the government is extremely dangerous and not letting anyone have their use their voice at all and kind of like the result of this video there were rumors I couldn't find out if it was real or not because there was a lot of back and forth but there was talk about the government finding these five women that made the video and detaining them and then forcing them to film an apology video and post it And there's a picture, there's like a screenshot of the supposed apology video, and it just doesn't really look like them, Mm -hmm. but they were wearing headscarves and loose-fitting clothing, so I don't know. And I, like, nobody seems to know if it's real or not, if it's them. So um, that's kind of, like, all we know about that. It's scary because I hope they're okay, but, like, nobody really knows what's going on because Mm -hmm. they're not allowed to communicate. But that was a big thing that just kind of like went viral on social media and I think it was good to like reignite the protest around the world or just like the solidarity it shouldn't have ended but like they did a lot of good work by doing that video right and I remember seeing that video Mm -hmm. and I remember seeing like all the recreations or like 
other Iranian women like standing in support of them. Right. And I was just like, that is so scary. Like I can't imagine living somewhere with all of those rules and mm-hmm. literally knowing if you do one simple thing, such as dancing, mm-hmm. you could literally be put to death or arrested or abused. And it's scary. Or raped or like, cause they, those, the men who are running that government to be honest feels like a dictatorship to me but the men who are running that like they can do whatever they want Mm -hmm. they have no accountability for their actions like nothing they can do whatever so it's scary and it really just makes me like think like wow like I'm really blessed and fortunate you know Mm -hmm. so wanted to start out with that one because that's extremely important um and that's like really going on right now. Mm-hmm. So the next one I actually think is very interesting. This is in South Korea. Um, this one was very interesting. And I will preface this with there is a lot of words in Korean in this that I looked up how to pronounce them. And I'm going to do my best. Oh, best. Okay. <laughs> so nobody come for me. Okay. Because I'm trying. So, but this is actually, like, a really cool story. Okay. I am interested in this because we hear a lot about North Korea Mm -hmm. and how crazy it is over there. Yeah. But rarely about South Korea. Mm -hmm. So, I'm curious. Like, I haven't heard anything happening over there. Yeah. In terms of, like, women's rights, so. This is very uh, female empowerment. Okay. It's really cool. So... South Korea is under an extreme patriarchy. Women are forced to defer to their fathers and adhere to strict beauty standards there. And this is from a very young age. Like, they're raised, like, you always listen to your father, and then he'll pass you off to a husband, and then you listen to your husband. And they grow up with, like, really incredibly strict beauty standards. Like, if you don't wear makeup on, like, the men are not going to want you. Like, you're ugly. And, like, you have to change your appearance for the men. It's all for the male gaze Mm -hmm. in the worst way possible. And we've heard a lot about that with plastic surgery and body modification over there. Exactly. Yeah. So – And also, just a side note, I think the patriarchy and, like, honoring your parents and especially your father, like, I think that's a prevalent – Thing in their culture. Yeah. It, yeah. It, just in, like, Asian culture in general. It is. But they're, she was focusing um, on, like, it is an extreme patriarchy over there. So a woman named Young Me, she got tired. This whole story was about her journey. She got really tired of constantly being told to change her appearance to please men. She got super depressed and was really stressed and unsure about her future because she was like, I don't want to just always be relying on a man and, like, not be able to do my own thing, not be able to be independent. Like, I don't want to just go and get married and then do whatever he says for the rest of my life and have no say in it. So she started to get super depressed and just was not in a good place. So this was a quote from her. She said, I could not go outside without any makeup. I felt ashamed of my face, she said. I had this pressure of wanting to look beautiful and wanting to be desirable physically or sexually. And this is at a young age. Like, she was a teenager Mm -hmm. when she felt that. Like, she was – had to be sexually desirable to men, so she had to wear makeup. Mm -hmm. So she was scrolling through Twitter in 2018, and she came across footage of protests taking place in Seoul, South Korea. And in Seoul, there was a lot of, like, violence against women going on, and men weren't being held accountable for it at all. And so it was really scary. So um, there was, like, a lot of stuff going on with, like, violence against women, revenge porn, sex crimes, like, all of this stuff. And these men were not being – like, if they were even prosecuted, they would just get, like, a fine but no jail time. And that was it. Big shock. Mm -hmm. So that was not the case for a woman that – had taken a non-consensual photo of a nude male model art at school and she posted it online. So he was oh, modeling. Okay. She took a picture of him naked without his consent and she posted it online. Really? Which she shouldn't have done that. <laughs> right. 
But she was sentenced to 10 months in prison and court-ordered sexual violence counseling. And so all of these demonstrations that young me was seeing in Seoul were a result of how, like, it was just hypocrisy. Like It's very obvious. Yeah. Like, the men were raping women and they were just getting a fine or not even anything. And yes, what she did was wrong. She took a picture of him and posted it while he was naked. Yeah, but like wrong. she got heavily right. prosecuted. That's not fair. Right. So the main thing that caught Young Me's attention about the protests is that the big thing they were doing, the women were shaving their heads on camera in public as an act of rejection of the forced beauty standards that were upon women. Slay. So yeah, Major they were slay. just like in the streets, shaving their heads, taking videos of it, and being like, "No, we're done with this." I was obsessed, <laughs> and honestly, like that's becoming so prevalent now. Like a lot of women are shaving their heads now, right? To show, like, we literally don't care. Yeah, about the male gaze, and like so many people do it, and are just like, "I feel so good about myself." Mm-hmm. Like it's cool. It is cool. So it's cool to see, um, like women all around the world doing that. So after this, um, young me ended up shaving her head too. She stopped wearing makeup and she called or she joined the movement that was called escape the corset. So that's what they called it to start out with. And, um, this was just happening a bunch of, among a bunch of young women in South Korea. So this whole thing, sorry, this is like long, but I think it's really cool. And there's a lot of details. Um, so this whole thing eventually started the, what was called the 4B movement. This is where you guys cannot come after me for the pronunciation. I'm going to really try. So the 4B, 4B movement is short for four Korean words that all start with B-I and that meant no. That means no in Korean. So the first no was Bihan and this is the refusal of heterosexual marriage. The second B was B. Cholson is the refusal of childbirth. <laughs> Good job. B and A is saying no to dating. And B. Sexu is the rejection of heterosexual sexual relationships. So basically, the 4B movement was rejecting heterosexual marriage, childbirth, dating, and heterosexual sex. And when they say, like, rejecting this is my interpretation of it but like basically just not conforming to society's typical standards right right like why do i have to marry a man why do i why is it expected of me to give birth Mm -hmm. why is it expected of me to only be with the opposite sex Mm -hmm. so i think that's really cool it was cool cool and like the 4b movement that's cool that's awesome so um like you said they they basically said like by rejecting all of those things it's the only way for korean women to live autonomously mm-hmm. so that was crazy um and so this is a quote i thought it was just really good um it says while forby's adherents may hope to change society through demonstrations and online activism and by modeling an alternative lifestyle to other women they are not trying to change the men whom they view as their oppressors It is too soon to tell whether this movement can survive and thrive over the long haul, but its ideas and actions have already affected the country's online discourse, its politics, and most of all, individual women's lives. I like how they said that because I feel like that's a huge thing for our platform is like, we just want equality for all genders. Mm -hmm. And so they specifically mentioned like, they're not trying to change the men. They're just trying to change their lives. Exactly. Right. Because they can't control the men's actions, but they can take their lives into their own hands Mm -hmm. and kind of like reject the culture that they've all grown up. Yes. Oh, that just is so sad to me that like from such a young age, they're told you're only pretty if you wear makeup, you're only pretty if you alter your face. And that's very common with a lot of women, not just South Korean women. No. It's very prevalent there, for sure. Yes. But I have, I mean, through, like, indirect messages through social media yes. and stuff. But, like, I've never been straight out told, you need to wear makeup to be beautiful. Exactly. Right. Which is difficult. 
like how can that not alter the way you see yeah, yourself seriously yeah so um yeah that was the 4b movement in south korea i was just obsessed with that i literally love that i literally was like we could dive into that and do it i episodes. know i'm so interested yeah so that was really cool we have one other current event um and I, I like just, like, talking about the different countries. I do, too. Um, so this is um, Chilean feminism. So we're talking about Chile today. And so one year ago, Chile – sorry, it's not Chile. <laughs> it's Chile. One year ago, Chile's president pledged to become the first South American feminist government. Whoa. So he was like, I'm going to focus on it. Like, this, we're going to oh, focus on – Oh, was a male? On- Yes. Okay. He was cool. like, we're going to focus on, like, female empowerment, female equality, and, like, we're going to get more female voices. So that was a year ago. And I, this article that will be in the show notes is evaluating, like, how well are they actually doing mm-hmm. a year after he said this. So the current president, he's the youngest Chilean president in history. Chile's current interior minister is the first woman to be named interior minister. And the president's cabinet has 14 out of 24 women. Whoa. So the 14, that was at the time of, like, when the president was, the new president was inaugurated. So um, that was a year ago. Currently, there are still 12 women in the cabinet, which I think is pretty good. That's 50%. 50-50. Um, That's perfect. Yeah. So um, this is a quote. So in general, Chile is more advanced than other countries in the region in terms of women's participation in politics said Antonio Orleana. Orleana. Sorry. (laughs) Sorry for correcting you. (laughs) Said Antonio Orleana, whom Boric, the president, chose to lead the Ministry of Women and Gender Equality. So in the president, Boric, in his first State of the Union address in June last year, he declared that he would put gender parity and equality at the heart of all government business. He even installed the women, the women's and gender equality ministry in an office in La Moneda for the first time. So that's just like a region. Mm-hmm. So he like really made it his priority, like a big part of his platform. Like I'm going to make women like our equals and give them a voice and like a platform. So he was really trying. So the one issue, which I do think is interesting because I think a lot of times people will be quick to blame women. So some people were bringing up the fact that, like, oh, like, if the government is not doing well or if it's failing, they might blame women, saying, like, oh, well, he just – he's been focusing on bringing more women voices in the last year, and now the government's failing, so we just need men to lead, you know? Mm -hmm. So that is a valid concern because people would very – like, definitely be quick to say that, you know? For sure. So there was a recent survey – that showed that 58% of Chileans still considered their country machista, so, like, masculine, mm-hmm. and 82% of men and 65% of women said they felt little or no collection to Chile's feminist movement. So it seems like it's a lot of talk and not a ton of action because mm-hmm. the the um, citizens just aren't really connecting with it. And it could also just be slow growth. Mm-hmm. Because it takes time for things in government. Yeah. We know that in America. Yeah. And it could just be slow growth and the people just aren't maybe aware of, like, all the behind the scenes. I'm really trying to, like, advocate for this because I think it's great. Yeah. Yeah. And, like, there's a lot of stuff that could be going on. Mm-hmm. But, you know. Um. So one big thing. On September 4th. The Chilean government rejected a bill that would have paved the way for more reproductive rights for Chilean women. So that's obviously... And that doesn't really line up with what yeah. the president was saying. Exactly. So it's... And similar to... Like, I don't know if their government runs like we do in America. But, like, you know, the president can't just... hes It's not a dictatorship. He can't make every single decision. It's up mm-hmm. to, like, the Senate and the House in the United States. So it could be similar there. But it's still just, like... Uh, that would have been really important for women's yes, rights. Yes, absolutely. Um, and that was at a time when there was a lot of protests and, and uproar around the entire world. World, yeah. So, um, and then basically over the next year, at this current point, over the next year, the ministry hopes to improve women's economic autonomy and workplace through 
just bringing in like massive daycare resources for children so that women can work more. And they also announced a plan to roll out low cost contraceptives. So that's great. And that's definitely a step. We'll see if that happens. Mm -hmm. And because there has been a lot of talk and just slow growth, which could be for a lot of reasons, like you said, but um, I'd love to see that happen. Right. And especially with having the cabinet be half women, you would hope that there would be some quicker progress going on. Right. But I think it's a great first step that they're talking about it and that they have plans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that is our last little current event about Chilean women. So we got to hear about Iranian women, South Korean women, and Chilean women today. And I just find it so fascinating to learn about the world in general, and especially like how women are living in other countries and other regions, other parts of the world, because it's very different from our experience here. Right. Um, there's a couple things that I want to bring up before we end. Yeah. This is kind of reminding me of the two books that I am reading for Women's History Month that I mentioned in our first episode of March. Yeah. But I finished The Dream House, which was about a woman who was in a relationship with another woman. Right. And the other woman was extremely abusive. Okay. And this whole episode is about like, broadening our perspective right so it was just really interesting because I was like this is a huge problem that goes unnoticed because usually when we think of think of domestic violence it's a man against against a woman woman. yeah but it was really sad to like read about that and how it like still has affected her to this day yeah um and then the other book was um I didn't realize this until I started reading it but what is it called I started it I'm like 50 pages in it's called when they call you a terrorist and it is written by one of the founders of black lives matter. Okay. So I'm like reading her story and like how she grew up and the, um, role that the police played in her life and her family. And it's just very eye opening. Mm -hmm. And I think it's so important to, for one, like do episodes like this where we can get outside of our own little space that we live in. But like also, The Black Lives Matter founder from America. Mm -hmm. So it's like we're living in the same country and we have two completely different experiences. Yeah. And so it's just really important to open up our eyes to that, I think. It is, especially with like racial differences, because Mm -hmm. like we do recognize like our privilege as white women. And we've been talking about this kind of a lot recently, especially me and Tyler, just like the difference in experience of, like, a white woman versus, like, for Tyler, like, an Asian man. And it's just very – it's important to recognize those differences and, like, educate ourselves and try – like, try to – like, we have privilege, so we need to, like, help protect other people and give other Mm -hmm. people a voice that are minorities. Mm -hmm. Um, because everyone deserves that equality, you know, and there's just so many things that go unnoticed in everyday life that like we're able to just do freely and other people can't, right. you know? Right. And it, I don't know. It's just like the book is just so interesting and it's so sad. Like, mm-hmm. I'm like, I just can't believe this. Like while I was growing up with like a very privileged childhood. Like mm-hmm. she was like worried about her brothers being arrested for nothing and the police just trolling her neighborhood. Yeah. And it's just so sad. And like, I'm happy I'm reading those for the change of perspective. Yeah. Um, yeah. So anyway, I just think that's like a great way to end women's month. Mm-hmm. Um, but also I need to plug an update for you because this was an update that we didn't talk about your permanent bracelet before oh my we gosh. end. Yeah. <laughs> Cause I was looking at it. Um, yeah, me and Tyler got permanent bracelets and it was really cute. I made a TikTok about it. It was my Valentine's Day gift to him. And also like, um, like two weeks ago, we like hit six months. And so it was just like really good timing and they're really pretty, honestly. Like, and it was a very, like, it was very romantic and it was just like, it was just a good night. Like we, we just like felt very connected because like Mm -hmm. this is permanent you have to go get it cut off it's like welded on and it was just like a connect like a symbol of like our love and it was cute yeah it's very cute you guys should go watch Haley's tiktok it's on her instagram yeah 
Anyway, I just Thank had a plug you. for you. <laughs> Thanks. I actually thought about it and I was like, oh, like next episode I'll do like that as my update. Mm-hmm. But yeah. Thank you. Very cute. Yeah. So we are going to end this episode. And also, like, we do love doing these types of episodes. So if you guys hear about, like, a story going on in another country or, like, something that you want us to cover, please let us know. Because we, like, try and stay up to date. But it's really hard to cover everything. Right. So just DM us. Send us an email. Whatever you guys want to do. Um, follow us on Instagram at Real Talk About Feminism Pod, same as TikTok. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and our email newsletter. And we'll be back next week, beginning of April, with a brand new episode. Bye, everyone. Bye.